During the afternoon of August 31st, 1939, German forces made their final preparations for the invasion of Poland. Air crews studied their targets. Tanks moved to their assault positions. Then in the early hours of September the 1st, German soldiers dressed in Polish uniforms attacked a radio station on the German side of the border, leaving behind some bodies. This was the aggression which Hitler later used to justify his attack. At eight that morning, German troops pushed aside the Polish frontier barriers and mobile forces raced forward. Two days later, on September the 3rd, Britain and France declared war, honoring their promise to stand by Poland. But by then, the Poles were in deep trouble. They were not only outnumbered, but facing a new form of warfare for which they were ill-prepared. Blitzkrieg. In 1939, the German army consisted of one and a half million men. Its elite were the panzers, tanks, six armored divisions and four light divisions intended for reconnaissance, a total of 2,400 tanks. These had been designed to break through an enemy's defenses and strike deep, cutting communications and spreading confusion. Enemy strong points would be bypassed, left to the following infantry to mop up. The new German air force, the Luftwaffe, was also designed for Blitzkrieg. It had 2,500 aircraft lined up against the Poles. The most notorious was the Junkers Ju-52 Stuka dive bomber. It was a form of flying artillery, making pinpoint attacks in support of the fast-moving ground forces. The Poles could muster just 600 planes. On the ground, it was just as bad. Poland's army was just 500,000 strong. It had only 880 tanks. It even had 11 brigades of cavalry, lances and horses against armor. But it wasn't just numbers that gave the Germans their advantage. They used their panzers in a radically new way, the separate, hard-striking units. The Polish tanks were dispersed to support their infantry. The Poles' task had been made even more difficult by the German takeover of Czechoslovakia. The west of the country, including the capital Warsaw, was now surrounded on three sides by German-controlled territory. This geographical advantage was essential to Germany's grand plan. The task of the first thrust of the tanks was to create an initial breakthrough. But actually winning the war depended on deep pincer movements designed to surround and crush the enemy. These would come from Army Group North under General Fedor von Bock. He would launch two thrusts from Northeast Germany and East Prussia. Army Group South under General Gerd von Rundstedt would launch two more from Silesia and Slovakia. The aim would be for the pincers to meet near Warsaw and Brest-Litovsk. From the start, it went well for the Germans. The Polish Air Force was effectively eliminated within the first two days. Panzers cut through and struck deep. And 
the Stukas and medium bombers proved devastatingly effective. The poles were sliced apart, pinned into pockets which yielded vast numbers of prisoners. Legend has it that some Polish cavalry units gallantly tried to attack the panzers. But it was futile. They were just brushed aside. By September the 8th, the inner pincers had met up. German troops were advancing on the outskirts of Warsaw. September the 17th, the outer pincers met at Brest-Litovsk. On the same day, Soviet forces crossed the eastern Polish frontier as part of the agreement reached between Hitler and Stalin in the Nazi Soviet pact. The Polish army was now in full retreat, its government fleeing abroad. Warsaw, however, fought on. Its defenders rejected a German offer to surrender, so the full fury of the German war machine was turned on it. Watching it all was Adolf Hitler, who had followed close behind his conquering army. On September the 27th, Warsaw surrendered. The next day, the victors carved Poland up according to the Nazi Soviet pact. The Soviet Union annexed slightly over half the country to the east. Germany took the rest. Both regimes began rounding up anyone who might present a danger in future. Many were murdered. And for the first time, the Germans revealed how they would behave against those peoples in Eastern Europe whom they considered inferior. They sent in the Einsatzgruppen, special SS squads, to round up Jews. Most were forced into ghettos in the major cities where they would be starved to death. Others were executed on the spot. This was not, however, the end of the Polish army. More than 50,000 troops escaped and eventually reached France. There, a provisional government had been formed by General Władysław Sikorski. The Poles would fight on bravely from abroad. In Britain, the air raid sirens had sounded within minutes of Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's announcement that hostilities had begun. In fact, despite their politicians' guarantees of Polish sovereignty, Britain and France had done very little to help Poland. As Hitler had gambled, they had no idea what to do once they had actually declared war. Both countries had begun mobilization. Air raid precautions were speeded up. Anti-aircraft guns were placed in major cities. Shelters were erected. Soon, children were being evacuated. Everyone had to carry gas masks, and a blackout was introduced. The British Army began to deploy its 100,000-strong expeditionary force to northern France. French troops did advance a little way inside the German border, but they refused to move beyond the protective cover of artillery range. The initiative was still firmly in Hitler's hands. And he at least knew precisely what he was going to do next.